Um, so as we get started, it's, it's right here at 1130. Um, I'll explain who I am, but I would love for you guys to post in the chat um, your name, where you teach, what you teach, um, and what your favorite ways are currently to assess your students' learning. I am Charlotte Dungan. I am the AI program architect here at the North Carolina School of Science and Math. I have been an educator since 2006. Prior to that, I was a computer programmer for... <coughs> Um, and I um, have a degree in learning and teaching from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I've worked in K-12 settings, um, both formal and informal. And right now I develop curriculum, resources, and professional development for teachers, as well as teaching um, just a small bit of my time um, throughout the state through um, distance education, through um, interactive video conference. So I have taught um, in this format since 2018, 2000, a little over two years um, I've been teaching online, um, as well as lots of other teaching experience. So that's me. If there's a question, please, you can just unmute yourself and ask partway through. It's not necessarily a lecture. Um, we can have a conversation. You can also post in the chat, and I'd be happy to check that as we go. Um, so I wanted to start with um, this idea of the learning pyramid. Um, have you guys seen this before? This idea of the way students learn best is um, not necessarily by lecture. And um, we tend to default to lecture, just like I'm doing right now in this webinar, um, which is not the best way to learn. So that's why I would like you to discuss. You'll notice it as we bring it to the discussion level, 50%, um, it will, you'll get a lot more out of this conversation. Um, I'm not gonna make you do that um, because you're not being assessed on this. And you probably have some intrinsic motivation that's coming to play. So. Um, if I just talk at you and show you some things, it'll probably stick a little bit better than, um, than a student's um, maybe extrinsic motivation. Um, but you'll, you'll get more out of this if you take some things away and then practice by doing or teach others about what you learn here. Um, so um, starting with that idea that learning is generative, that students learn best by creating content, discussing it out loud, making things. Um, the first thing I would say about online or distance education that it's very easy to back away from the student and focus on the content. And um, I think that's a mistake. I think the connection to students and acknowledging their unique situations and getting to know what they're passionate about and um, encouraging them to be a part of the classroom environment is really um, key to successful online learning. So that's my plug for tomorrow's webinar, which is at the same time, 1130. Um, and it's about that first um, couple of weeks that where you're getting started with online learning and how to create a classroom culture that actually feels really collaborative. Um, one thing that I like to do in my classes is um, if you can turn your web and, your webcam on, then we have more of a, a group um, experience. And so I would generally ask that for my students. So if you're able to, Megan, Lacey, um, we'd love to see you while we're here. Any questions so far about the learning pyramid? Um, so I want to talk about why we do assessment. Um, we do that for two reasons. The first is that we want to check the student's progress. We want to see if they're moving toward the learning objectives that we've given. And then the second reason that we assess is to ensure that they've mastered the content that we expect them to have, have gained at, the, at that time that we're offering the assessment. Um, neither of these things are the learning process unless you design your assessments very carefully. So oftentimes we're creating assignments or other work and we are then assessing, um, but the learning process is what happens within the student. And so the more that we can give them um, opportunities to practice what they're learning, um, the better those assessments will come out. Form do you guys know about formative assessment? And do you use it? Okay, uh, would you mind sharing how you use formative assessment? So my students spend a lot of time in every class doing as opposed to listening to me talk. And one of the ways that I do that formative assessment is they have to pick somebody in their group that's going to be the speaker for their group. And then they move to another group. So the speaker gets up and moves. And what I'm able to do then is to see how that transfers from one group to the next because I can arrange them in my classroom 
that given teacher eyes and teacher ears from years of experience, I can keep track of what each of the groups is sending to the next group. And then when they go back, I know what is it that they didn't get? What's the next problem that they need to be facing in order to pick up the part that they didn't get? So I have a long collection of problems that go with each of the various, I'm speaking from a math point of view, um, that go with each of the various pieces that I'm going to need them to get out of a set of work that they're doing. And that helps me choose what's next. What's the next problem that I'm going to do with them? Great. So that uh, doesn't translate so well to online, right? Like maybe that's your concern. Um, do you have the opportunity to meet like this um, with a Google Hangout or a Zoom room? Um, probably. And so I'm, I'm in the Western North Carolina mountains. And so bandwidth, access, even cell reception for phones is not close to guaranteed anywhere. And, and I may drop out of this meeting in and off, off and on because of the internet that is available in our region. So that, which county? So, um, so I'm in Macon County, but I have students from as far away as Cherokee and Clay and okay. Graham and, and Wake County. I mean, I've got them from all over the state. So I'm a little concerned that the classroom culture I already have established on assessment isn't necessarily going to work the same way. So that I'm hoping to hear a lot of new ideas. Sure. Okay. So I do teach um, remotely, just like this via Zoom. I have students in Jackson County, Transylvania County. I just did a webinar in Henderson County. So I do understand there are especially some of those kids that don't have great access. Um, one thing you can do to continue a conversation is to just have everybody stop their video, which really slows down the 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 amount of bandwidth needed and allows them to keep talking. So you can put them in breakout rooms in Zoom um, through like I, you have the option. And um, usually my rural kids can still have a conversation even if they can't um, see one another. Um, the other thing that I do um, much like you is I have um, these, I'll just show you um, what I use. This is my, uh, sorry, I, I have a whole window of things, but like I have this, um, space in my LMS. I don't know which um, LMS you use. Do you use Canvas? Sorry, that was slow. I, we have Blackboard. Okay, so I just keep a bunch of handy links at the top of my um, modules. And what I have here are these share boards. And these work like your, your small groups. These are um, permanent Google Docs that just link um, so if I click on Shareboard 1, you'll see um, that students have used this and it's, I haven't cleaned it up. So we were talking about the definition of affective computing and there were groups working in boards 1, 2, and 3. And they were, they, they're labeling what they're doing and I'm popping into these and, and offering feedback as they write them. And then they're discussing like, here's some examples of the things they were doing. And you can move students from board 1 to board 2 to board 3 to have that same kind of like talk about the thing that you're doing. Now, because you're doing math, the, the doc might not be the right choice for you, but you can use um, either um, Lucidchart, which has more of a, like a flow feel to it, um, or just some sort of online whiteboard that might um, be more conducive to doing some math problems to it. Does that help uh, at all about that, that first bit? Well, the, the real thing is, I, so I'm teaching pre-calc, which is totally different than teaching number sense for elementary teachers. The, the entire goal is what you're doing has a very different kind of feel to it. And so for one group doing the share boards is great. For the other group, the whiteboards are going to be critical in terms of what's going on. So yeah, those, those are certainly ideas of things that I've thought about. And it's kind of nice to hear somebody who knows what they're doing in this area talk about the same things. So one of the options that you have right here in Canvas is a whiteboard. I mean, in Canvas, in uh, Zoom is a whiteboard. So if you right. have access to 
Zoom. Um, Jean Bay, do you have a question? Yeah, I just want to uh, to ask you a question. You showed like the group uh, group board one, two, three, mm -hmm. and I can see if you if you want to see group ones, you cannot see group two or group three at the same time, right? Actually, you can. Um, students. If you, can if you make like windows, different windows, right? Um, I, so I'm wondering whether whether a, a Padlet is is a substitute for those. Sure, and I do I do use Padlet too, um, and I was going to show you an example a little later, but I'll show that too. Um, in so, uh, sorry, it moved you guys right where I'm trying to click. Um, so I do use Padlet also. Use it, it sounds like in your in your chemistry class. Yeah, yeah, I use it. Yeah. So here's um, an example of a Padlet that I created. Do you guys, do, do any of the rest yeah. of you use Padlet? Okay, so you're already familiar. Like, um, yeah. the big thing with Padlet for me is that they there has to be requirements for what they post. Um, so this is an example of just a conversation that students were having that was great. Um, but they also built a collaborative timeline um, of, this is an AI course, so we were talking about AI and they had to, um, in the rubric for this assignment, they had to post a picture, they had to have a, a heading that was meaningful that included the year, they had to keep it in the right part of the timeline and it had to have a description with credits at the bottom. So this was just, um, you know, a collaborative, they had a certain, had a, they cert each had a certain number of topics that we built out in a Google spreadsheet first, um, and then they went and researched those further to build this, uh, which I thought came out pretty well, like, really cool examples of things. So um, sounds like you already all know about Padlet. You guys are great already. You're all, do, all doing great things. Um, Megan, I'm sorry, I didn't catch what you teach. Oh, physics. Physics, great. Do you have any special tools that you use online uh, for, for some of the physics that you do? Um, not, uh, no, because we're not, a, we're, I have 10 laptops for 30 kids. Okay. Uh, when we're in session, uh, so I I mainly do qui like mini quizzes throughout as my formative assessment that they can retake um, oh, to get better as they go through. But I don't have any digital resources right now. Okay. So there's some pretty good simulations at NetLogo, NetLogo Web, um, and they are free and they they don't require any downloads so if your students are able to access through a chromebook they'll still be able to see some of those physics simulations which may um, be helpful and applicable to um, both chemistry and and physics um, so going back to formative assessment we're going to check student progress i want to show you how i do that in canvas um, with exit tickets. It sounds like some of you use some sort of version of exit tickets. You're not unfamiliar with them. Um, but I, so I just want to show um, the way that I do it so that I can aggregate the information online very quickly. So um, this is the topic. So I would give like um, when they're, they're designing their topic. Um, so this is one thing that I do in online assessment so that they can't cheat <laughs> because cheating is a real problem for online learning. Um, my daughter is a junior at a local um, UNC system school and she dem she shows me group chats of how people cheat and students are way smarter than we are about um, being able to answer questions, do quizzes, any software you use that you're trying to you know, do a multiple choice question or something that you're giving all students the same answers, they will screenshot, they'll take pictures on their phone, they'll call each other, they'll sit next to each other. Um, she has, there are whole chat boards where they share answers. So your, your ability to simply give a quiz that's A, B, C, D, or that has the same mathematical answers is no longer. You just simply cannot trust that they are going to um, be honest it, it's not realistic. They will use social media to share. Um, so I ask them to um, customize their work for their uh, individually. Um, so for example, a good chemistry example of this is like um, osmosis is uh, something you could teach about. And um, so they could apply the osmotic process. I'm not a chemistry person, um, but like to um, how carne asada is made or um, how does osmosis work in the desert plant 
um, or some way that they're going to show their learning in their own context um, so that they can't get around the um, being able to do what Fred is doing because um, they have a different question. So I ask them about their own topic, um, what clarifications they need. These are, these are my exit tickets that I give. Um, and then um, reflecting on the discussion for today, this is how I take attendance online too, um, where I ask a question where they think about um, what happened in class and then reflect on it. And then, I, and then this is the part that I wanted to show you right here is after the class, this is a multiple choice question um, that they get credit just for answering. And it helps me gauge the level of understanding in the course. So um, after they've answered, I can see a bar graph of um, if I'm on target and anything where like um, they're feeling good or they're beginning to understand, but they still feel good is really helpful for me. Um, when I see even more than one, um, I need help and feel overwhelmed. I know that we have some content to cover again. Um, and for those kids that are saying this was too easy, that's a place where I can um, give additional support and enrichment. So um, this bar graph is super quick. Um, and the, and do you, have you made these in Canvas? Do you guys use an LMS that can do these types of surveys? Yes, okay. So I'd like to show you how I create these because um, I think it's important to know like how to formulate it. So I go over here. Oh, I didn't think that was going to do that. Let me make this window a little bit bigger so I can get my menu. There we go. Um, and I go down to quizzes. And this exit ticket, all my exit tickets are a certain type of quiz. They are in, ah, uh, it moved. Sorry about that. It's this quiz type right here that's called a graded survey. And so when a student does a graded survey, I give them like four points or something. If there's four questions, I give them credit for doing each question, but they automatically get 100% grade once they've submitted the survey. So you're not grading this thing. You're just able to tell if they've completed it or not, and then you can read the responses and reply appropriately. Um, the other thing I do if you're using Canvas is I turn off that they can see their quiz responses, and I keep all of these other things off. So I just keep all of this blank. I assign it. I make it the date, the due date of the class. So, um, you know, if, if this is our class date, I would make it due by the end of the day today. But then I leave this until button until, um, you know, like the next class day or two more class days, depending on if your students are having some technical challenges and getting online or um, I know some of my students have challenges with sharing um, laptops with siblings or needing to care for siblings that are out of school. So giving them some leeway, like making an expectation that it's due today, but giving them several days to complete it. This is how I take attendance in this asynchronous way is like, if you've completed the exit ticket and I can tell from the questions that you've answered here, um, that you, this is where we would create our quiz. Um, then I know that you were uh, here attending class today. Um, in Canvas, if you're often um, using the same questions, like that question I showed you about feeling good or whatever, you can look for your own questions. So once you've created the question, you can find it here. Um, and you can just look like I have a, an exit ticket. How are you feeling about this today's lesson? or what questions you have. I use these all the time. And so I just add them to the quiz and then they show up here and the, the multiple choice is already built in. So um, if you create this once, then you can use them over and over. And for a system administrator, you can create these for your whole organization and you can have every teacher use them and implement them. Um, you can see like there's unfiled questions which are mine and then there's course question banks which can be created for the whole organization right here. So that's really nice to give teachers a tool if you're serving multiple teachers right in that question bank space. Any questions about graded surveys and exit tickets? Go ahead, Jimmy. Um, I didn't use the service. That's, um, that's just really for service, like, uh, like have you had a chemistry before and have you um, 
Uh, have you taken AP chemistry exam? If you have taken that, what's your score? Something like that, because we, we just use it really as just a survey survey, not some sort of assessment. Uh, one question I have um, is if a student leave a question blank, say I have five questions, they answered four, and will they get five points or four points? I actually go back and if they didn't answer, I reduce their grade. And um, mm -hmm. the way I do that is in my syllabus um, for online learning, I have a section here called collaborative participation. And okay. that's where those exit tickets go, but it's also where any formative work is submitted. So every, any daily classroom work, I don't mm -hmm. give them credit for it because they're still learning, except that they've mm -hmm. completed it mm -hmm. to the best of their ability. And then um, they're only really graded on their unit projects, final exam and final project for a grade. Because okay. I really want formative assessment to be formative, and okay. I just want to make sure they're participating. It's funny what they'll do for four points. That's so, percent of their grade. So if so, because you said if they, as long as they submitted, they get say five points. If you set it five, mm -hmm. I was just wondering if they only just did one thing and randomly, and then sub, as long as they hit the submission, then they will get five or the the system will give like every question say one point I, i'm not sure i've never since yeah. i only used the survey and i i didn't care about the grade um so i wanted to show you i i don't think i can show you without showing student work uh -huh. and I, i'm not able to do that um for privacy um but what i can do is if they answered only three or five questions or they didn't you know, they just didn't write a sentence. They just wrote like one word instead of <laughs> like X, X, X. <laughs> yeah. Um, if they do that, then I just take off points. And there's a little bar at the bottom where it's, uh -huh. it's called fudge points. Oh, it's just okay. minus the points. And, and you can even just say like, you're required to fill out all five, you get zero. And, and they'll learn very quickly. Like you actually have to answer the questions. Oh, okay. um, but really they, once you come to class the next time, talking about the things that they um, reflected, they know that those exit tickets actually matter to the okay. classroom. In the same way that we're talking right now and it, it's different than if I was just lecturing at you, probably about stuff you didn't wanna know about. Mm -hmm. um, when you bring the points that they bring up or if you say, you know, I saw that we didn't really have good clarity about natural interaction last time we met. Um, let's go back over that again. They know that it's worth their time to do well on that exit ticket and, and give feedback because they know it's going to be um, benefiting their own learning. I see. Um, so yes, you will have occasionally a student that'll skip a question and you just fudge point it off. Okay. You can change it. Um, so how hard is that to integrate within a Zoom class? Like, and so I'm thinking that your exit ticket of how things are going would be really effective at various points in a math class because if they haven't gotten part A, going to part B is probably not a good plan at this point. And I'm assuming, so I know this is within Canvas and that's fine. The kids are good at working in Blackboard and we have a similar capability. How hard is it to get them to actually move to that and come back? Um, so I only do them, and you, you could change this, but I only do them at the end of class. And it is the way that they show um, attendance and participation in class. So I do have students that have technical challenges. Um, I taught through the last hurricane where I had seven weeks of students who were not able to come to school, and they had various situations. One was uh, would go to grandma's house, and there were like a three-year-old in the background and grandma tottering by and another would have to go to McDonald's in order to connect. And so it wasn't an everyday thing. And so the exit ticket was the way that they said, hey, I've, I've watched the course video or I've done the, the work that you have assigned and I've you know, collaborated with my peers on some document and, and here's, what I've, here's how I've reflected. So it was the way that they checked in as being present. Um, so, I, but I only did it at the end of class. I've never tried it in the middle. I think for me, that would be kind of overwhelming in the middle of the day. Um, and I hope, does that help? 
Well, yeah, I mean, have you used it within Zoom, have you used even like the thumbs up and that kind of stuff to give a similar to that last one? I can't imagine doing the full exit ticket you had. It's much more the sense of doing portions of that keep track because I do that every day in class where I'm doing that check even when they're sitting in those wonderful long rows that colleges don't seem to understand is not the best way to teach kids but um, I can do that as I go and I'm just trying to figure out ways that I can maintain that yeah I actually do I do you know like thumbs up thumbs down and I do this middle thumb too um, quite a, quite a bit and if you don't have video um, they can do that through the chat as well they have like um, little icons the students will find them quicker than you will it's reactions so there's a little smile with a plus and there are like claps and, and thumbs ups and there's one right um, so I can I can hopefully take that off I don't know <laughs> how do I turn it off for myself I guess there it is okay yeah, there you go. So those are helpful. Um, I do think it's important to have students speak as much as possible. So if you have a very large cohort, um, you may just be checking in per group, um, taking the temperature, you know, one to five kind of thing. Um, so that's formative assessment and we're checking their understanding and their engagement with the material using those exit tickets. I try not to make them take more than five, maybe 10 minutes. Um, but then summative assessment is at the end of the learning processes, which is what we normally think of as assessment. Um, but it's not the process itself. It's that how we give credit for the completion and mastery of the material. Um, so exit tickets are for attendance and, and questions and discussion. Um, and that's that collaborative participation. But the assessment that we're going to talk about next is that um, ensuring that students have completed the learning objective. Um, and I want to take a quick moment and talk to you about a book that I left across the room. Um, it's called Science in the City, and it's um, a recent release, um, and it talks about how we reach urban and, and other under-resourced students um, who may not have the same rich vocabulary and culture um, that, that we uh, as educated people have been um, have had, had, had access to um, and I really love what they talk about in terms of disaggregate instruction so this is where with you, when you have a difficult concept like um, a function or a chemical process that you first teach the idea without any technical vocabulary at all in a, in a way that a student can convey their own knowledge in the, the vocabulary and context that they speak in. Um, I'm gonna show you a quick example of this. Um, so I, this is one of my exit tickets. So this was still a formative assessment, um, but I was, I was at, asking them to describe, what we were learning about natural interactions and how artificial intelligence systems um, try to interact very naturally with people and I wanted them to share their own experiences once they'd learned um, that concept and then I had them give a definition um, of a term that we had just learned in their own words these are all um, disaggregates so they're they're not trying to be technical they're just giving examples and this is something that we did in class about facial expressions and um, the movements that they make and what what uh, emotions that might be expressed so these are uh, and then I asked them and you know what's interesting to them about this unit so nothing technical here even though the next concept the next day will be technical so I've disaggregated the content from the the vocabulary and the technical piece um, so I'm going to check their understanding of the base concepts before I give them the vocabulary. So the next day that we would do this, I would um, ask them to do a similar type of assignment, only using the rich vocabulary and um, more technical, maybe mathematical concepts that we talked about in a more humble context the first time. And then most importantly, in the third application of this disaggregate um, methodology 
you have to have them use the vocabulary over and over and over. So they would do it an exit ticket, they would talk about it with their peers, they would have an online discussion, and they would have to explain and then make arguments and then extend their learning into um, a new field. So if they were first talking about it at home, now they're talking about it in a public health setting, something like that, okay? And then um, because this conversation is so important and relevant um, to the learning process in that disaggregate, um, I use an online discussion forum, which is built into most LMSs. So this is a graded discussion. And I'm very clear in the description of like, you're gonna explain, th this happens to be a project, but explaining, uh, you've already read your, you've already done your reading, you've already written your, your reflective essay, you've already started building with Scratch. This is our very first uh, coding assignment. And then they describe their plan, they talk about who their partners are, um, and then they write back and forth to one another using the outline that I've given them. So um, this is an, on, do you guys do online d d discussion yet? No? Okay. So even a math class, a chemistry class, they should be able to describe in words, talking to one another, or maybe asking questions with one another in this format, the, where you've outlined very clearly what they should talk about. Um, so look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to make a darts game or a Ferris wheel. Uh, oh, have you thought about a merry-go-round or a popcorn machine? Because um, they're building games in this, in this example. Um, I do have a rubric. I'm going to share it just one second. Um, great question. Thank you for bringing up rubrics. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Okay. Yes. Um, so the one that I had an example for, um, Timothy asked for a rubric, is for a project. Um, because I use a lot of projects in my class, as you saw. So this is um, just one project checkpoint rubric. So a project checkpoint for me, um, I've disaggregated the creating of the project with the final result of the project. And so this is a project checkpoint that students have to use as they're working on their final project um, in order to show that they're moving forward and their group is functioning in a healthy way. So um, they're listing goals. So um, in this class, they have to use the Agile methodology and they like burn down a task list. It's very, it's very like, I don't know, techie. Um, so that they know what this means, like clearly defined goals are like small bits that anyone from their group can pick up and do. Um, they're explaining how they're testing with users. They're, they're thinking about their future goals. They're posting um, to their project log, which is a, a blog. It's a public blog that they're explaining how they're, where they're getting stuck and they, they have to post to that. Um, they're describing how they've used their homework time and they, um, they're showing a summary. So this is just a rubric that I used for that. I do have, let me see if I can find the rubric um, for, for discussions. I have to look for it. I will find it for you, Timothy. And if I can't do it right now, I'll, I'll send it along. Um, let me get back to my... Any other questions um, so far about disaggregation? Go ahead, Jinbei. Uh, about the discussion, I have used it for uh, my, um, uh, so pre-bench uh, discussion, mainly for safety concerns because this, this is chemistry uh, a class. And we sort of really uh, emphasize the material safety uh, uh, data sheet. And so uh, in order to, to encourage participation in a face-to-face -face class, we created a discussion um, um, type. So every, because that says everyone you have to post first, and then you can see someone else uh, work. So this is some sort of sharing. They are allowed to sort of copy paste someone else's work um, uh, this post, for example, oh, um, you, the major concern with HCL is you cannot avoid inhalation, something like that. So you need to be to stay away in the distance. So um, eventually, they they if they themselves did not have this kind of thought in their own 
mind and after the discussion they learned it so they can copy it to their place. My question is some student asks that because the discussion function it has something like they can talk. Have you ever have experience like just let them talk or what's the value of talking? I can see um, in a face-to-face -face class and it's not, they have already talked this, they talk this and at the same time they type. So with the uh, remote discussion, do you think talking might be better than just typing? Um, I think yes. Um, a, a lot of times we just talk in class. Um, and I do have them reflect on their talking. So um, I was trying to pull up a, uh, an example of that. Let me see if I can find one. Um, it is, yes. Yeah. So this is an example from when they did a presentation. Um, let me just, I'm moving my windows around a little bit here. Um, so this is where they are reflecting on a, a presentation, but they could, you could do the same thing for a discussion. This is um, a graded assignment, uh, which I'll show you the rubric for in a minute. But um, so like when you were talking, what would you have changed or included to improve your presentation? Um, focus on your content rather than, than your delivery. So it's not really important if you did a great job as a public speaker, because this isn't a public speaking class. I'm re really much more interested in what did you realize you left out? Um, I let them talk about their strengths and then I uh, ask them to give themselves an overall letter grade based on the requirements of the rubric um, and then have them explain their answer. It's really interesting to see what students um, say for this particular question and you could do the same thing for a discussion. Um, one of the questions or one of the norms that I start with in my class, I call it one over n. So if there are three people in the in the room, then you should be talking one third of the time. And that means if you're a little bit quieter, that we set the expectation that you need to be included because all voices matter. And if you're a little bit more likely to jump in, then, then um, you may need to rein it back so that you can make sure that everybody has enough talking time. Um, and just setting that norm and then enforcing it, like reminding people before a group discussion starts, um, I uh, sometimes talk privately via chat to students who are more likely to keep talking um, and ask them to listen and amplify a quieter voice. So I would say to a Stephen, you know, hey Stephen, um, I know that you're a leader in this class and you have a lot to offer and I really need you to be a leader in this space and make sure that um, Peter's voice is heard because um, he's often a little less likely to speak up and it means a lot when you say, um, hey, Peter, what do you think about this? Or Peter, you've really offered some great stuff in class and I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. And, and so when you take that strength of that speaker and you turn it toward hearing other voices, um, it, it sort of becomes not an issue as long as you've set that norm. Um, and then when you ask them to reflect in their um, exit ticket about their group participation. Um, so this is, this is uh, I do a lot of these assessments of students thinking about other students' work, but um, what would you have asked about other students' work? What were the strengths of their presentation? And then um, I have them send all of their constructive criticism to me so that I can filter it and only share um, what might, really be helpful and shareable. Um, so they are required to turn this in for three students. They don't have to evaluate every presentation. That would be far too much content. Um, but they evaluate themselves and three students that they've been assigned um, throughout the presentations. So that allows them to um, even go back because you're recording the, the class. Um, they can go back and maybe fill in those questions afterward too. Um, but you can certainly modify what I was just showing you for a class discussion to say, were you um, amplifying quiet voices? Did you, were you sure to speak up? Um, and I ask my students at the start of class, like, are you more comfortable, less comfortable with speaking out loud? And, and then I use their responses to uh, tailor how I speak with them in class. Questions so far? Good. All right, I'm gonna um, see, I'm still gonna try to find that rubric um, 
that I have. I, it's hard for me to do it while I'm talking to you guys, but if I don't get to it, I'll, I'll send it afterward. Um, so disaggregating instruction is where we were, um, that you've taught a concept, then you've added the vocabulary, and then you've given them lots of time to talk about and speak and explain and make arguments. And then you're grading a conversation related to the topic, um, and you're using collaborative documents. So that's um, the Google Docs or your whiteboard. And you can have them screenshot to show what's happened. Um, I recommend that you, if you don't have something like Google Docs that shows a history, that you ask them to set a timer and you can take a picture every five minutes and see how evolution is happening. Um, another resource is Miro. If you're doing any sort of storyboarding, um, it is like post-it notes. Like if you use post-it notes in your classroom and you're like having everybody do stickies, Miro does the same thing and you can actually take pictures, actual pictures of of post-it notes on the wall and they become virtual. Um, so it's a pretty cool tool. Um, let's see if I can pull it up for you. Visual collaboration software is what it's called. Um, and M-I-R-O. So if you were looking for that like whiteboard or, or some way to collaborate, um, you might like this tool. I also use, um, uh, what's it called? Oh dear, Prezi. I use Prezi on occasion too, but I like this just because you can use a, a bunch of different types of frameworks and you can move things around super easily. So here's brainstorming, you get, here's a bunch of stickies and you're just, you know, you're able to move them around just like you would in a classroom. So if you're anybody's sticky fan, like your, your uh, post-it notes, great. So this thing is exactly the same um, and it, it's just really easy. Students can access it. I think it's free for a while so you don't, you don't have to worry. Like I don't, we're not paying and I've used it. So um, I don't think you'll have any trouble with that. Okay, questions so far? All good? All right, I wanna talk about um, the problem of cheating. Do you guys have specific concerns about cheating in your classrooms? Yeah, okay. I, unsurprising, um, I have had lots of incidences. Um, I'm pretty, I mean, I really don't think that you can use an online quiz application like we've been seeing for those graded surveys and have it um, be unmoderated and have student learning be shown and assessed correctly. So if, if you were in a space like a, an online school where there was a facilitator that could watch students, I wouldn't be concerned. But if your students are all at home, you basically don't have a moderator for them. And so I hate to say this to you, but I really don't think that you should use um, graded tests that are multiple choice or sim simple answer. Um, the way that you have to show that makes it cheat proof is that your topic is unique um, and customized to your class so that they can't go download anything um, and that you give separate questions and people in your class different work. Um, so same types of problems, different problem sets. Um, if you're giving a paper that there's a, you know, topic, yeah, project based, we're going to get to real next. Yes, for sure. Um, but you need to look on whenever you create an assessment, you need to Google your assessment questions and see how quickly they, you can find the answers. Because if it's one second, your student is not going to put in the time. Um, so I only use projects and presentations in my class um, for, for, um, summative assessment because I feel like it's the only way that I can ensure that students are doing the work. If you have to have some sort of, you know, you've given each student an individual problem set, make it at least harder for them and make them write it down and submit a written copy in pencil. I know that sounds crazy, um, but I teach a computer science series of courses and my um, written my tests that I've, I give very few tests, but when I want to know that they understand content, I write, I make them do essay tests that are written in pencil with a moderator because I could not find a way to ensure 
that those simple yes, no, A, B, you know, show me what a if, if else statement is. I couldn't find a way for them to not find a way to cheat. So just take that like straight up. You, you just have to throw that out the window. You, you can't control that classroom environment. You're basically letting them go home and do whatever they want. Um, sorry to be such a downer. Um, so I do use projects as I showed the project checkpoint, um, and that I have them do a plan that's separate from the execution that's graded so that their plan is a separate step. Then um, I give a very clear rubric about the a project that's being assigned, which I'll show in just a minute. Um, and that as much as possible, those projects have a real world application. So I wanna show you an example of um, a computing course. This is about a three minute video. Um, it's a computing course that I developed so that students had a real life application, um, a real life application for why they were making computer science projects. Um, it didn't feel right to me that we would just like tell them to go learn some coding like for nothing. So this was my attempt to make it really relevant. And the more you can do this for your students, the better. So um, here, here's the, the video. Have you ever considered what it must be like to see the world through the eyes of the American river otter? Or why the bee is always so busy? Or even what it must be like to live in fur? STEM scholars in the North Carolina School of Science and Math's interactive video conferencing program created an opportunity for visitors of the world's largest zoo to experience the answers to these questions and more. One of the best parts about being at the zoo today is to see high schoolers teach elementary school kids about science. And you see these kids light up with the excitement of knowing how a polar bear insulates itself or how a fish can survive climate change. It's amazing. Students use computer science and computational thinking to build apps and also create websites and wearable devices that further enhance the public's understanding of creatures in the wild. So our project consists of two apps and a bee suit and a helmet, and it aims to create empathy for honeybees. We expected 10,000 visitors today at the zoo. We've seen several thousand already with 10 projects. Students from five different schools, and um, they've been able to share their knowledge with the people here at the zoo. We expect to do it again next year, and we hope to see it on The social philosophy underlying this course is the belief that technology's highest purpose is to promote empathy and understanding among its users. So took the learning objective, which was let's learn some computer science and thought about a way to make a final project that was really um, motivating and relevant to the students. And we had a client. So if you can do the same thing with chemistry or math or like um, I have a student who is super into baseball. And so we've been talking a lot about data science and how the applications of um, you know, what his passion is have to do with math. Um, so he's learning a lot more math because it has to do with this interest of his. Um, so wherever you can do that and make that connection, um, it makes the output of the goal of your class that much more engaging. Now I know y'all are stuck at home, right? Um, but you can find competitions that do the same thing, Kaggle competitions or um, whatever in your subject. I'm sure there are competitions and, um, math olympiads and stuff but if you can connect your learning goals to some deadline um, it's super motivating to students any questions about that idea of like getting the project into the real world so i actually think that's great and i do those kind of projects with my students unfortunately in a course where the goal is to so pre-calc for example is a pathway course they not it's not enough for them to learn some pieces of it they really have to be able to show mastery of all of those things or their calc one course and their calc two course and their calc three course are going to be devastating um 
so while I, I do include those types of projects, they can't be the basis for them showing me that they have some um, technical knowledge of the various techniques of things that we're doing. So one of the things that I am working on um, to do, particularly with pre-calc, the, the number sense course is entirely different and, and entirely harder in many ways. But um, I'm, I've never given multiple choice tests. That's nev nothing I've ever done. And I think that in this particular instance, I may be forced to do some of that. But in addition to that, they're also going to have to take pictures of their work on their problems and put them in a document. And we're gonna practice that to where they'll have 10 minutes after the test to put that on Blackboard um, or their test doesn't count. So they can go out um, I mean, obviously, they'll have a timed amount of time for that test, but sure, they can go out and they can get somebody to give them the answer, but their answer is going to have to have the work supported behind it through some kind of, of document of their work, which is exactly what they would be giving me on any math test. And there are, I don't know about for chemistry, but there are lots of applications for math that will give every kid the same problem with different numbers. And so, yeah, they might be able to talk to Susie next door, but Susie's gonna have to solve her own problem and their problem um, in order to get that done. And so there's less likely that they will do as much of that. Um, there's, no, there's no expectation that they're not going to find ways around it. They find ways around it, but there are some things that are certainly available for mathematics that we already use. We already use a, a system called WebWorks that is an open source system used and developed by mathematicians from around the world to create those very kinds of problems. So I can give them a timed WebWorks that they have to provide me with the documentation of their work on to help that. But um, if I were developing an online class, I would be able to do that project-oriented thing. To do this starting on Monday, that's probably so, not going to happen. I've got something faster for you that will address that issue of like, I need, they need to learn 19 concepts. It's required that they know all 19. And so the way you can do that is to gamify it. Um, and so Badger is um, a, a way to issue micro-credentials. It is, um, you create your own badges. It doesn't, uh, there is a pricing model. A lot, there is a free version right here. So you don't have to pay anything to start. And what you can do is, um, I don't know if it'll let me do this. My Badger version is in Canvas. This would interface directly with your um, web software, whatever you're using. And basically you would make these little badges that um, there's a, hunch, a whole bunch of pre-programmed ones, but um, you can literally just say, okay, you have done the four requirements that show me that you know, uh, whatever, two multi-polynomial something or other. I don't know. I can't think of any math concepts right now. They're all flying out of my head. But you could show those 19 concepts that they need to know, and then you could, um, uh, you know, award them with these badges and that's one way to like okay you're you're 50 percent to that badge goal you need to complete these three other assignments it's it's kind of a cheat um it's a fast cheat so it at least gives them some some milestone to look forward to and, and shows their forward progress so we have uh five minutes left and i just want to make sure we have enough time to share with one another any any other resources or um Ideas, suggestions that we could share with one another. Oh, and Flipgrid. Yeah, Flipgrid is great. Um, go ahead, Shinbei. Um, I used Kahoot. It used to be, you know, for the face-to-face -face class, it used to just for fun. And because Kahoot has this music, has this jumping, something, it's just for, you know, making, just for relax. So we, I have used the Kahoot for like exit ticket um, or entry ticket. 
with uh, I, I I thought I, we have a discussion with uh, our teaching teams on on, on Thursday. We're talking about pretty much like in math, we cannot um, quickly develop an appropriate project oriented assessment. So we simply just lower the the weight of test and we decide to just sort of like like the, the what the math teacher just said and uh, it give you some time it's timed and feel free it's open book feel free to look for whatever resource is and then you you shoot the photo of your test sheet and upload it to me like give them like extra five minutes after the time the, the, the test to, to upload. Um, so, but we did talk about maybe we can use Kahoot for like quiz because we also, our uh, syllabus also include quick, weekly quizzes. And uh, the, the limitations of Kahoot is it can, you can only do multiple choice. But it's very short time. It's one question by another question. They just simply do not have that much time to to get uh, help from some, some somewhere else because we can decide like, okay, this question is only 20 seconds. So 20 right. seconds is not enough to, to Google search anything. So we were talking, this is what we are going to try um, because with chemistry, we, we have some conceptual uh, content. We have some um, uh, calculation math issues. So we were thinking about half of the quiz will be Kahoot. And say I have like three questions, five questions, which are conceptual, multiple choice, and this can mimic the closed book feature. And then after that, we say asynchronous um, um, quiz is, okay, you get this um, problem solving, and like, like apply gas laws to solve this problem, um, um, sort of. <laughs> feel free to cheat <laughs> within a given time or something like that. And, uh, but at least we, we were, uh, it's built on this philosophy is when you show me your own handwritten test sheet, even if you copied it from someone else, then you steal your brain. <laughs> you have to think through it, right? So yeah. there are some scratch in your mind. So we were thinking about with that half closed and half open and feature, at least so we can dilute the, the artif artificial effect of student cheating uh, with the open book. But we still do not have a good idea with our, because of chemistry, we have a final exam. And we were just hoping we can come back <laughs> and do the exam. But it looked like that's not, not feasible. We, we still do not know what we are going to do with that. So currently, we, we decided to just try uh, this half Kahoot, half uh, open book quiz. Uh, on canvas with uh, the the quiz, which is low stake. So right. that means it doesn't matter too much. Um, but we, we, we don't have good idea with tests and exams. Yeah, it's it's hard um, to make that shift. Um, certainly, the more you can can um, connect it. Oh. Um, so as we close, thank you all for being here and for sharing um, so thoughtfully. I, I did want you to know that um, there's a really good discussion rubric from Central Michigan University. Um, I'm, uh, I just searched for um, rubric and I'm having trouble bringing it up in the full version here, but I love that it has like, there's a criteria for the original message. There's a criteria for the follow-up, there's an overall contribution, you know, this is insightful, it made a serious effort, it encourages uh, generation, um, and it's, you know, there's no spelling and grammatical errors, that sort of thing. So um, maybe that's helpful to you. Um, I liked this one myself. I could not pull up my own rubric uh, fast enough to, to bring it up in class, but um, this quick uh, search did it for me. Um, it, for me, the rubric is one of the ones that I can download 
um, from my school. So um, anybody who's at NCSSM should be able to get to it um, through the repository of rubrics that we have. But I'm not able to do that unless I'm creating an assignment um, that I couldn't just pull it up from an assignment that I'd already used. I tend to customize mine um, really specifically for the content. Um, so thank you for being here and um, um, appreciate all of you and please feel free to reach out if, if you need anything more or want to collaborate. Um, I'm charlotte.dungan at ncssm.edu.